Welcome to the National World War II Museum. Uh, virtually, I'm here physically. Uh, my name's Jeremy Collins. I'm the Director of Conferences and Symposia. Today, uh, we're bringing this program to you with Hurricane Zeta a couple hours away from hitting. So I wanted to let all of our audience members know that we want to bring this program to you come heck or high water. Uh, hopefully just heck. Uh, if we do have any interruptions, I wanted to apologize beforehand for the technical difficulties with the uh, pending storm. But now it's my pleasure to get this program started by passing it on to the museum's Samuel Zamuri Stone Senior Historian and the Executive Director of our Institute for the Study of War and Democracy, Dr. Rob Satino, who will be leading today's conversation. Rob? Thanks, Jeremy, and uh, welcome to everyone um, from beautiful New Orleans, Louisiana, quite literally in the path of the storm, quite literally uh, perhaps a few hours from now in the eye of the hurricane. So we, we hope uh, everything goes smoothly and we're, we're hoping, I like what Jeremy just said, heck or high water, New Orleans gets a lot of the latter and, and, and we hope we don't get any today. Now, having said that, we, we uh, are really excited about today's program. Um, Every now and then uh, in my line of work, you get to interview an, an author whose work you respect and you've read every, you feel like you've read every word he's published. And in the case of this particular author, that might be difficult. But Ben McIntyre is a writer at large for The Times uh, UK. He's the best-selling author of numerous books, The Spy and the Traitor, A Spy Among Friends, uh, the, the Great Betrayal of Kim Philby. What a, what a great book that is. Double Cross, uh, Operation Mincemeat, a book that I know many of our audience have uh, have already read. He's written and, and, and uh, presented BBC documentaries of his work. Uh, he's, a, he's a star in the field, I guess I would say, of, of espionage history. And Ben McIntyre, welcome to the National World War II Museum's webinar. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I only wish I could be there in person, one of my favorite cities in the audience. So thank you very much for having me. Well, Ben, you're a, you're a master on this topic. Uh, cloak and dagger, daring do, uh, and in Agent Sonia, I, I, I will just tell our audience, you, you really dish it up in style. But let me begin by asking you a, a, the kind of standard question when I get a good author on my screen. I never like to let her or him uh, go without asking this. Why this book? Um, wh why this topic? Why now? Is there something about the moment we're living in that suggested this amazing woman? She's Ursula Kaczynski, but she's no, better known in her uh, professional life as Agent Sonia. Why this book? Well, as so often with these stories, it was really accidental, my discovery of, of her story. I was researching a completely different story, which, was, which has always intrigued me, which is the story of an OSS operation, the predecessor uh, to the CIA, right at the tail end of the war when they began to parachute anti-Nazi Germans into the collapsing Reich to carry out sabotage operations and, 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 and intelligence gathering, just as everything was falling apart. And this was operated from London. And they began to recruit anti-Nazi Germans. But in fact, at the back of this story was a woman. She wasn't identified in any of the papers, but who was providing the names and addresses of likely candidates. Now, what the Americans and the OSS didn't know was that, in fact, all of these characters were diehard communists and they were being recruited by Agent Sonia Ursula Kaczynski. But that was my starting point. And I began wondering who this slightly shadowy figure was. Then I began to spool back in time and found this remarkable character who goes right back to the Weimar Republic and even earlier. And why now? Well, because for me, it was something of a challenge, Rob. I mean, I've never written through a woman's perspective before, and I've never written about somebody who was a committed communist. Most of my stories come, as it were, from the other end of the telescope. And I just felt it was time, really. And her story is quite extraordinary because, as many of, uh, of your listeners will know, it, this is a very male-dominated world, the world of espionage. There are many women agents. There are women spies, starting with Matahari and going all the way through. But, but a woman intelligence officer who was trained to the pitch that she was trained to the point where she was a colonel in the Red Army, that is unique in my experience. I, I didn't know, a, I couldn't find a single other woman who had risen so far and so high within any intelligence service, let alone just, just, the, just the communist system. So it was time to tell her story. And it, in a way, her story has been hidden for far too long because she was a woman. It was both her her most profound disguise, I'm sure we'll go into 
uh, she ruthlessly used her gender to, um, to, to hide what she was really up to. But also historians have tended to shy away from women subjects and, and it was really time to tell her story. And I wouldn't have been able to do so had I not had the incredible good fortune of being able to interview her surviving children, two of her sons, who very generously simply opened the family archive to me. They allowed me access to all of her papers, all of her photographs, all of her diaries and letters. And so even though there, there I am, I'm a man, I've never, you know, I haven't, I haven't lived the kind of life that Ursula lived. I always felt that she was kind of with me in some way, sort of guiding me through this story. And that instead of trying to ventriloquize for her in some way, I kind of had her voice with me. And that was a great comfort in a way and a great, I written the book without it. Tell us, uh, tell us more about, about Ursula. She was a, a good communist, uh, she claims, and you quote her, by the age of 17, when she was beaten in a, a left-wing rally in Weimar era Berlin. How had she gotten to this point? Um, tell us about her family life, this G German Jewish intellectual culture. She has a, a, a circle around her, which is a who's who of, of intellectual leftism in, in the early 20th century. Tell us about Ursula, the young woman. That's right. I mean, it's always been possible to kind of understand the sort of person that Ursula became, unless one has a grip on the chaos of the Weimar Republic in Germany between the wars. That extraordinary period when economic disaster was looming, the fascism was on the rise on the right, and, and extreme leftism in the form of the Communist Party, the German Communist Party, was extremely powerful in Germany. And there were many people, particularly in a, in a way, Germans of Ursula's background. She was a, she was, she came from a very intellectual academic family. They were very well off. Uh, they lived in the sort of haute bourgeois life of Berlin. They knew everybody, they, from Einstein to Leibniz, to, to everybody who was kind of anybody on the left there. And she, partly as a result of her experience as a teenager, seeing the appalling poverty in Weimar, the appalling kind of um, the degradation and the contrast between rich and poor, and her family's leftist leanings, she joined the Communist Party at the age of 17 out of conviction. Uh, despite her parents' objections, and she never really wavered. I mean, that's, well, she did waver. There were moments in her life when she, the whole communist project seemed to be coming apart in her hands. And, and in a way, her doubts and her, her equivocations over the nature of communism is part of the story. But because she was very young when the Bolshevik Revolution took place, and very old when the Berlin Wall came down, her life in some ways spans the whole of communism. She was a way, it seemed to me, of exploring that extraordinary event, a movement in, 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 in world history in the 20th century, for good and for evil. I mean, she ended up working for a, a brutal, ruthless Stalinist regime. The extent to which she knew about that, we can certainly discuss. But her communism wavered from time to time, and she certainly had doubts. And so in a way, she's a really wonderful way to explore that story. But it all starts in Weimar, Germany in the 1920s, when as far as she was concerned, and this was a perfectly respectable intellectual position at that point, as far as she was concerned, the only people standing up to the fascists were the communists. So for her, in a way, it was a kind of logical migration to the left. It, to, to me, I'm, I'm fascinated by one of her uh, of phrases that you write in the book, you quote in the book, and of course it would have been a typical thing to say at the time. The Soviet Union is the future. Of, of course, today we live in an era when the Soviet Union is clearly the past. Definitely the past, exactly. I mean, of course, she had never been to the Soviet Union at that point. She had not seen what the Soviet Union was or, or could even imagine what the Soviet Union might evolve into. But for many idealistic young people in across the world and not just in Germany. And don't forget that, of course, Germany was considered to be the crucible of the next revolution. Many people in Germany and outside it believed the next revolution was going to take place after the Russian Revolution was going to take place in Germany. And that was that was that was quite a widespread belief. And yes, she she saw the Soviet Union and 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 all the ideology that went with it. She saw that as the future. And she really she clung to that for most of her life. She starts out as a, a pretty I'm, I'm trying to think of the word bookish character. Uh, her world are, are, is the publishing milieu of Weimar era Berlin. Bookstores. Um, she works in bookstores on, on more than one occasion. So it sounds to me, you know, you start out with an idea and maybe a yearning for something. 
how does she get into the action? I mean, all of a sudden she's in Shanghai. I don't want to give too much of the, the beautiful detail of this book away to our readers, but how does it happen that she makes that transition? Because many idealistic young people have thoughts and, and often the, the phrase we use is, oh, we outgrow that, but not Ursula. She, she grew into an action-oriented figure. Tell us about that. Well, this is one of the fascinating contrasts and conflicts in a way in her life. She is, as you say, she was, she started out as a very gentle, bookish, literary, she wrote, she wrote from very early on, she wrote poems, she wrote short stories, she lived in a kind of, she lived in a house in Berlin that contained the largest private library in Germany. I mean, that's, you know, she, you couldn't get much more bookish than that. There's a wonderful photograph of her aged, I think about 14, sitting in a tree, utterly absorbed in a book. That was the way she was. And yet, as you say, she ended up espousing violent revolution during the Weimar upsurges and the battles between left and right, she got a gun, she learned how to shoot. She was ready from a very, very young age to go to war on behalf. And that was partly because she was seeing what the brown shirts were doing and the, the rise of the SA and the, and, and the kind of brutality that she was seeing on the far right. So in a way, that's what makes her so interesting, I think, is that for the first half of her life, she is battling fascism utterly on her side you know she, particularly during the war when the Soviet Union and Britain and America are allied to try and defeat Nazism she is an absolute heroine and then of course history pivots around her in some ways and with the start of the Cold War she is spying against the West she well, sees no she sees no change in her in the trajectory of her beliefs but from our point of view from our perspective she's suddenly on the other side of the fence. And, and to me, that's absolutely fascinating. But you asked, how did she get into it? Again, as in so much of life, it's accidental, partly. Right. She, she ended up, she not ended up, she went to Shanghai. There were no jobs to be had in, in, in although she did spend a brief period in, in America. She lived in New York. She worked in a bookshop in, in, in upper Manhattan. So she had an experience of America and it began, started a kind of love-hate relationship with the States that lasted for the whole of her life. There were, there were elements of America that she deeply admired and others that she despised. But she ended up with a called Rudy Hamburger, who was a very talented young architect. And he was offered a job in Shanghai working for the British, working for the British Municipal Council. And she went along. She was only, she was barely, what was she? She was only 24 by the time she got to Shanghai. And it was an intoxicating place. I mean, it was, it was a huge melting pot of different races and very rich on one hand, a great mercantile center and massive Chinese poverty on the other side. And she again witnessed this at first hand and was shocked by it. But it was really a meeting with a figure long forgotten to history, a fascinating woman called Agnes Smedley. Uh, most of the people in this story, by the way, have the most extraordinary names. Um, Agnes Smedley. <laughs> that's good, Bear. <laughs> was, was, uh, that's, that's, what led you, that's what led you to this topic, no doubt. <laughs> well, it does. I mean, they're all called things like, well, I won't go into them, but all double barrel names. But Agnes Smedley was at that point a very successful left wing novelist. She had published a highly successful novel called Daughter of Earth. But by the time she met Agnes in Shanghai, she was already a communist spy. She'd already been recruited by Soviet military intelligence. And she effectively recruited Ursula. She handed her over. Ursula explained that she was a communist, that she longed to do something. And the context of the times were that, I mean, Shanghai was the birthplace of the Chinese Communist Party. But the Chinese Communist Party was undergoing brutal repression at the hands of the nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek, known as the White Terror, often forgotten to historians these days. But it was a brutal repression and something like 300,000 people were killed in the course of, of, of that uh, attempt to kind of extirpate the Communist Party. And Ursula was recruited, first of all, by Agnes Smedley, who handed her over to someone called Richard Sorge, who was described by Ian Fleming, no less, as being the most formidable spy in history, I claim, but it can be substantiated. And he was the key Soviet agent in Shanghai. And the Soviets were bankrolling the communist underground and Ursula was sort of brought into it. She, uh, I, I'm trying to think of the way you put it best, Ben, when, when you said her domesticity was one of her greatest assets. So. She's leading a double life. All spies uh, from time immemorial have to lead a double life. She has a wife, or she, excuse me, she has a husband and they, she's pregnant and then has a child by him. 
At some point, she's told by the party to leave him so she can pretend to be the wife of another man and they pretend to be a family. I think of Lenin, who, who once said, you know, the communist has no private life. You, you do whatever the party tells you. Is that, is that, what, is that what Ursula is about? She'll do whatever the party tells her? Not quite, because one of the things that I find so fascinating about Ursula is the constant tension in her existence between what she saw as her ideological duty to the cause and her responsibilities as a wife and a mother and a homemaker. Uh, and throughout her life, these two sides of her life were in constant tension. And even in old, old age, she continued to wonder whether she had been a good spy mm. and a bad mother. And the reality was that the cause required her to put her family second. And she struggled with that greatly. She did it, but she always put them second. And she put them in mortal jeopardy. I mean, there's no doubt that we'll get to this part of the story, I'm sure, later. But when she was operating in Europe, had she been caught, not only would she have been murdered uh, by the Gestapo, but her family would have been wiped out as well. So she was putting everybody at risk. And there's a very moving moment when she was writing about this, when she said, would I have, you know, she said, I'm never going to give up my family again. I'm never going to put them at risk unless, unless the revolution requires it of me. So she would have done it. Now, we find that in the 21st century, that, that the whole notion that, a woman, that anybody, particularly a woman, actually, would, would put her cause before her family as just terrifying, just against human nature. But bear in mind, there is a possible double standard here, because it's not a question that we would ask of male spies. Ever. We would never ask that question. You're right. We would never say, you know, he was a bad father, but he was a great spy. You know, that's, that's not a distinction we make. But she did. And, and it really was, it's sort of central to her core. And I, I mentioned at the beginning that I had access to her private papers. And time and again, she interrogates herself on this subject. Was I a bad mother? Did I do enough? Did I look after them well enough? And of course, it leaves a legacy. Secrets always leave a legacy. And when her family and her children found out what she'd actually be doing, and they didn't find out, bear in mind, until they were themselves in middle age, they had no idea that their mother had been a spy. And the discovery that she had lived this double life, as you say, that she had been someone completely different from the woman that had brought them up, that had a very long, long-term effect on the children. You've, you've met the children as you, you began your discussion today. Uh, they were of extreme help to you in writing this book. I mean, you even said you probably couldn't have done it without them. Did you talk to them on this very, very sensitive point? I did. I mean, the two sons, she had three children by three different men at three different times of her life. All three of her, the fathers of her children were her, her co-agents. They were all communist spies themselves. Two of them were her sub-agents. One of them was her boss. You know, so this world of domesticity and espionage entwined completely in this story. She did say at one point, I was no nun. She did. She, to be fair to Ursula, she was... She followed her, she followed her loves, she followed, including Richard Sorge, who was her first recruiter, who was her first great love. Again, there's a bit of a double standard here. You know, we love our spies that live the lives, the male spies that live the lives of a sort of, of a Lothario, you know, James Bond being the most cool. But actually, you know, she, she, she was a woman. She was a woman way ahead of her time in that respect. But yes, I did interview the two sons, the two surviving children. They were both, only one of them, alas, is still alive. The older one, Michael, died earlier this year in his 90s. And I remember vividly a, a conversation I had with Michael. He was the most charming and lovely man. And I said, you know, how, how tough was it to discover that your mother um, had, had all these secrets? And he said, it was a very, it was a really a very moving moment. He said, look, I've been married and divorced three times. He said, perhaps the problem is that because of where I came from, I never really knew how to trust anybody. Mm. And I found that really very poignant to hear from, from an old man nearing the end of his life. But another thing he said, which again, I was very touched by, he said, look, he said, reading the book, and he, alas, he only got three quarters of the before he died he said i now feel i know my mother a little better and oh. I, I found that that was that was very powerful for me that's a, that's a beautiful, must have been a beautiful a legacy of these stories like you know spies uh, secrets are toxic secrets are addictive you're in a secret world it's very difficult to give it up 
but secrets are very bad for you. Secrets do, you know, I know this, you know, having written now something like 12 books about spying, and I'm fascinated by that world. These stories don't have a simple black and white moral conclusion. People are damaged by these kinds of stories and, and by what happened to them. And the children of Ursula are no exception. It, it might even be said, and again, having read a, a number of your works, Ben, that, that spies rarely, that the story rarely comes to a happy ending in a sense of, you're a hero and you ride off to, in the sunset to the accolade of the masses. That's precisely what doesn't happen. You you tell lies your whole life. And I, I wonder if at moments it's difficult to remember which lie you're living at the current time. I think that's exactly right. It's, um, it's easy to tell one lie. It's very, very difficult to tell compound lies, to remember the lie that you told before. And it has a denaturing effect. I have no doubt of that. I mean, spying is such a strange profession really because and this sounds like an odd thing to say given how much I've written about it but you know spying often doesn't make very much difference spying often you know one side knows what the other side is doing and it, it all balances up but very occasionally in history and many of your your listeners will know this it makes a huge difference operation mincemeat is a good example um the deceptions that cover the the, the normandy the enigma is another one and Ursula actually is one of a very small pantheon of spies who really did affect the course of history. And we'll come to that in a moment. But her, but her intelligence on the building of the atomic bomb um, that she passed to the Soviet Union materially affected world history. And that makes her, again, quite exceptional, I think. You have a moment in this uh, book where Ursula Kaczynski, codenamed Sonia, Agent Sonia, uh, has come from a, a very genteel, uh, uh, as you say, haute bourgeois, upper middle class background in Berlin, cultured and educated. And she's actually helping uh, communists in Manchuria, helping them build bombs for acts of sabotage against the Japanese. You, you have a great story in there uh, about an ammonium nitrate purchase, which our uh, audience might know is one of the crucial ingredients in most kinds of high grade explosives. Can you Can you relate that one to our audience, please? Well, one of the many things that Ursula was trained in when she went back to Moscow, she went to a special spy school in Moscow called the Sparrow School. She was trained in radio technician work, build, how to build a radio, but also in sabotage, in bomb making. She was an expert bomb making, uh, bomb maker. And one of the things she had to do in Japanese occupied Manchuria. So this was the situation when the Japanese had moved into Manchuria and the communist underground was running partisan warfare against them. And Ursula was helping them. Ursula was their main link with Moscow. She was providing money. She was sending messages back and forth. It was dangerous. And there is this moment. And of course, in order to buy material for the bombs, you couldn't just go into one shop and buy everything you needed because the nationalist, uh, the, the Japanese secret intelligence service would have picked you up in a second. So she had to go shopping for different bits in different parts. And she tells a story about how she was wheeling her pram uh, to another hardware store to buy some ammonium nitrate, which was in its garden fertilizer, which is used for, for building bombs. And she went in there and because her, her Chinese was so bad, um, she asked for, I think it was 10 pounds of ammonium nitrate. And the shopkeeper misheard her and gave her an enormous hundred weight sack of ammonium nitrate, which she stuffed in the pram and put the baby on top and then wheeled back home again and realized she wasn't going to have to go shopping for a while. So it, it kept the, the bomb makers going. Who knows what those bombs were used for? I mean, the, the, the Chinese partisan underground did enormous damage to the rail network that the Japanese were trying to keep going. So maybe Ursula, I think Ursula's accidental purchase probably again had quite an impact on history. You're looking at uh, um, the, the author's ability to write a good set piece, Ben. I appreciated the baby on top of the sack of ammonium nitrate going back to the sabotage uh, of mill and, and building the bombs. It's really an astonishing story. And again, that ability to live in two worlds at once. You're caring for your child and you're, and you're buying explosives at the same time. But it's almost impossible to underestimate the degree of peril she was in. I mean... The Japanese Kempitai, the, 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 the secret police, were brutal and highly efficient. And they were all over this. They were, they were digging out communi the communist underground. But I have an extraordinary photograph in Ursula's connection, collection of the little house that she lived in. And if you look at it carefully, you can see the two bamboo poles. She climbed onto the roof and erected her own aerial to use her 
radio transmitter with, and you can see the poles that she's lashed to the chimney stacks at the end of at the end of this little house. How she got away with it, how the Japanese failed to spot this, is extraordinary. I mean, it has to be said of Ursula that she was incredibly lucky. We are the National World War II Museum, of course, and I, I would like to turn now to to Ursula's activities in the in the Second World War. Um, Ursula Kaczynski, Sonia's wartime spying activities. Which ones do you think were most significant? You've already referred to one, but I wonder if you can talk us through that a bit. Uh, it is for our audience. It's it's the meat of the book, and it's to me some of the most interesting uh, uh, portrayals of the entire book. Well, she she is redeployed uh, to Switzerland. She's sent to Switzerland at the right at the beginning of the, actually just before war breaks out with the task of running agents into the Reich. She's, she is to recruit people and send them into the German Reich to, to extract as much military information as they can. And she ended up, she, she built herself another radio transmitter. She set herself up in an idyllic little um, chalet on the, in the Swiss mountains overlooking Jake, Lake Geneva. It looks like a picture postcard. It's a beautiful place. And there she set up with her now two children with another, another child by another man. And she began running really the most important communications network with Moscow. I mean, there were, there were lots of spies operating out of Switzerland and she recruited her own. And, and, and they were known as the Red Orchestra the, 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 or the Red Chapel, the Rota Capella. And, and they were producing information from inside the Reich that was being sent to Moscow that was of, of, of huge importance. I mean, she linked up with other spy networks there, but she was one of the linchpins of it. And the, the story that astonished me that I'd never come across before, I don't think anyone has, was her plot to assassinate Hitler. She came very close to assassinating Hitler. She'd recruited two British communists who'd fought in the Spanish Civil War before coming there. Her family moved to London to get to escape the, the Nazi persecution. And she recruited these two men, both Englishmen, and she'd sent them into the Reich. So this was before the outbreak of war. And one of them had discovered that he, the restaurant he was going to was also Hitler's favorite restaurant. Hitler, it was called the Osteria Bavaria. And Hitler would dine there every time he was in Munich. And he mentioned this to Ursula, who immediately said, well, that's an opportunity. And they were, she reported back to Moscow. And the plan was they were going to get a bomb. She would build a bomb. It would be put in a briefcase and then put next to the, the very flimsy partition that divided uh, Hitler's sort of semi-private dining room from the rest of the diners. And they were going to blow him to smithereens. And this plot was weeks away from being put into action. I mean, it would have happened and it had a better chance of working than almost every other assassination plot I've discovered. I, I've read about in the, in the war and it was stopped because of the infamous Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, that the moment when Nazi Germany and, and the and communist Soviet Union struck an alliance, not an alliance quite, but a, a non-aggression pact not to attack each other. And at that moment, the day after that was agreed, Ursula received a radio message saying, cease all offensive operations against Germany. So she had to scupper this assassination plot. Who knows what would have been the future of the world if she'd been allowed to carry it through. This is Munich's uh, Osteria, Hitler's favorite restaurant. He'd go and have a bite of ravioli, a little vegetable on the side and frequented the place. I, I, I've been reading my whole life about plots to kill Hitler. This was one, I admit, that seemed to be the closest to fruition and one I had never heard about before. It, it, I had not either before, before I came across it. And it can't, be, it can't be exaggerated. I mean, it came very, very close. And Moscow was extremely enthusiastic about it. They were, they were very keen to kill Hitler at that point. I mean, a secondary point is that, of course, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, this kind of devil's alliance between, between the Soviets, and, and the Nazis was a hammer blow to Ursula. I mean, it was one of the first moments when she began to realize that actually the cause that she was following, the, 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 the Moscow line was what, you know, she life battling fascism and suddenly her cause was in alliance with fascism. It was a real, it was a terrible crisis of conscience for her, not the last either. There's a moment in uh, Orwell's 1984 in which the, the alliances suddenly shift and Oceania goes from being an ally of one and an enemy of the other to exactly the opposite. And everyone has to suddenly get on board. And in a sense, Orwell kind of nailed that moment that Ursula actually lived through. I'm quite sure Orwell was thinking specifically of the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact when he wrote that. I mean, it was a it was a terrible moment for us. Of course, it was short lived because the invasion of the Soviet Union by 
Hitler's troops in Operation Barbarossa in 1942. Suddenly it all turned around again and she found herself, as it were, on the right side of history again. But, but for a long period, that period between the molotov ribbentrop Pact and Operation Barbarossa, she was, she was basically put out to dry. She was left out to, to, to pasture. And she, for her, it was a really, it was a terrible moment because the cause that she despised all her life was suddenly in abeyance, really. I think our audience would like to know a bit more about Operation Hammer. So let me just outline, before I turn this over to you, Richard, for our audience. The OSS decides to parachute uh, anti-Nazi German operatives into Germany at the very end of the war. It's before the end of the war, March 1945 or so. Ursula helps to recruit them from her perch in, in Britain, I think, at the time now. Uh, every single one of these agents is a communist. Yeah. They're from her circle of friends, uh, fellow agents, uh, of, of ideologically like-minded uh, individuals. Did the Americans, and this is my question, do you have any idea that every single one of these agents was a communist? Did they suspect that Ursula herself was a communist? They never had direct contact with Ursula. Ursula had a cutout, had a middleman that she used to, to kind of basically to kind of distance herself from the recruitment. The OSS, as you say, believed they were sending their own spies. In, and, and it's an amazing story, the Operation Hammer. I mean, they were incredibly brave. They were parachuted in with high technology for the time. Uh, they believed they were sending in their own spies. What they didn't realize was that, in fact, every single one was effectively working for Moscow. Now, bear in mind, of course, at this point, you know, Moscow and, and, and the West and America are still in alliance. So Ursula could say, well, I'm just helping the cause, really. I'm just, you know, forwarding, um, you know, the general allied cause. But no, there were, to be fair, though, there were one or two voices on the American side, notably Bill Casey, who would go on to run the CIA under, under Ronald Reagan. He was one of those that did say at one point, hmm, have we really investigated the background of these people? How left wing are they? I mean, they knew they were left wing. They were, these were mostly former trade unionists who had been persecuted uh, by the Nazi regime and had, had gone into exile in Britain. So, so they knew that they were kind of left wing. They knew that they were unionized. What they didn't know was that they were all died in the world communists who'd already signed up as Ursula's sub agent. So it's one of those extraordinary moments. Um, and they managed to provide the Soviet Union with a, a key piece of technology. The Americans had developed what would become the walkie talkie it was then known as the Joan Eleanor system, um, named after the girlfriends of the two American technicians who'd invented it. Um, and this was a way that spies on the ground could communicate in real time with aeroplanes flying overhead. It was a revolutionary piece of technology. And these spies, Ursula's spies, the OSS spies, parachuted into, into, into Berlin and passed over this technology to the Soviet Union. I mean, and the Soviet Union had absolutely no idea. I mean, it was an incredible piece of, of, uh, of sort of spying technology. So the Soviets, in that respect, as they would later do with the atomic weapon, enormous jump on the technology, thanks to Ursula. Let's move into that very area, if you don't mind, Ben. Perhaps the most significant espionage contact that, that our, our subject, uh, Ursula Kaczynski, made in her life was Klaus Fuchs, the, the famous nuclear spy. Can you tell us about their collaboration and, and perhaps... How important was Ursula Kaczynski to the Soviet development or the rapid Soviet development of a nuclear weapon? Well, let me, I'll, let me paint you a little picture of where we are now, because from Switzerland, Ursula moves to Britain, ostensibly to rejoin her family who are there, in reality, to become the single most important Soviet military intelligence agent in the country. She's now, she's now a colonel in the Red Army, but she's also Mrs. Burton. And she lives in a, a tiny rural hamlet uh, in Oxfordshire in the Cotswolds, very beautiful, very, very quiet. She baked cakes. She now has three children by, by her husband, the third by her husband, Len, who is also her sub-agent. And if you'd met her, you would have met a perfectly ordinary refugee woman on a bicycle cycling around the countryside. In fact, in the garden, in the back garden, in the privy, in the outside toilet, she built a very powerful radio transmitter with which she was sending the atomic secret to Moscow. Because Ursula was running, not just Klaus Fuchs, Fuchs was the most important, but she was running a whole network of spies inside the British atomic weapons program. So when she was cycling off into the countryside, she was actually often going to meet Klaus Fuchs. Now Fuchs was a German physicist, prodigiously talented, also a secret communist, 
who believed that it, that it was unfair that Britain and America were developing an atomic weapon while in alliance with Moscow, but not sharing it with the Soviet Union. I mean, it was a very simple, a very naive philosophy, if you like. But he was handing over really the crown jewels of atomic research. He handed over something like 570 pages of documents relating to really the blueprints for how to build an atomic weapon. I mean, they were so complicated that Ursula couldn't even code most of them. They, I mean, they were all, so she would, she would take them, she would actually put them in a dead drop site, which believe it or not, was a hollow tree, three trees beyond the crossroads outside Great World Right, her little village. And there they would be picked up uh, by her Soviet handler, who was a diplomat, working under diplomatic cover in London. And when the Soviets detonated, I mean, latterly Fuchs moved from Britain to the Manhattan Project in, in, in America. And when he did so, Ursula handed him over to another controller in, 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 in New York and then in Los Alamos. And when the Soviets detonated their bomb in 1949, to the astonishment of the West and the consternation of, of Washington, that was largely down to Klaus Fuchs and Mrs. Burton of Great Rollwright. I mean, it's one of the it's one of the most extraordinarily untold aspects of that story. She'll be she'll hand Klaus, as you say, over to a handler in in America, in New York and uh, Los Alamos. And eventually that will, of course, for Americans play into the Rosenberg case. Klaus Fuchs is a crucial figure in that proceeding as well. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the ramifications of it continue still, actually. I mean, it is, you know, the running of the atom spies. How, you know, it was a it was a disaster for the West, really. But it was a triumph of Soviet espionage. I mean, it, it was extraordinary how deeply they had managed to penetrate on both sides of the Atlantic, that they'd managed to get right into the heart of it. Now, would the Soviets eventually have developed their own atomic weapon? My suspicion is they would have done so. They had some brilliant scientists on their side. They were quite advanced in this. Would they have done it so fast? I'm absolutely convinced they wouldn't. And we can debate, and I'm, uh, you know, we can debate forever what the long-term implications of that were. Ursula herself argued, as did Klaus Fuchs, that in a way, by, by stealing the atomic secrets from one side and giving them to the other, they had made the world safer, that they had created this balance of power between East and West that meant that neither side would use an atomic weapon. And we forget it now, but there were voices within the American administration, Curtis LeMay is the most famous of them, arguing that once the American atomic weapon was, was developed and once it had been used on Japan, it should then be used on the Soviet Union, that the, the Soviet Union should be obliterated, it should be a one-sided war. Well, imagine what the world would have been like if that had happened. I mean, America first, we talk about America first, America first with its, with its as the only atomic power in the world, I, I'm not sure how comfortable a world that would have been to live in. I'm not, this is not a support for communism, but I'm simply saying that the effect of the, the, the kind of piece of mutually assured destruction maybe that kept the world safer. You know, I think the last question I'd like to ask you, Ben, before we get, get over to some, some questions from the, from the floor. You know, I characterize this book as kind of a pilgrim's progress. She, she does it all. And sometimes you're rooting for her um, when she's spying on the, the Japanese or, or the Germans. And then sometimes you find yourself turned around and she's spying on the British and spying on the Americans. And at one point, she seriously considers murdering her lifelong nanny, the, the, the woman who served her family loyally for decades because, of course, she's found out a little bit too much about Ursula's uh, activities. My question for you is this. Did, did Ursula change in the course of her life, or, or, or did she stay the same while the circumstances, while the world around her changed? The answer is a bit of both, I think. I mean, she, she remained committed to the cause although she had serious doubts about it, in later, particularly in later life. And yet she too herself changed, I think. She did, we all do over life. We like to think that we are consistent in our behaviors and so on, but she wasn't. And, and indeed the, the, the moment you allude to is really the moment I think when the collision between her private and emotional and personal life and her political and, and secret life collide head on. Because as you say, the life, that, you know, the nanny that had brought her up, that had brought up her own children, a German woman, had come across what Ursula was, she knew exactly what Ursula was up to. And fearing that she was about to be abandoned by Ursula, 
she tried to betray her. She was the only person in Ursula's life who ever tried to betray her. And there is this agonizing moment where they, they, she and her husband, Len, and Len was a tough cookie. I mean, he fought in the Spanish Civil War. They discuss whether or not they have to liquidate the nanny. I mean, that is a terrible, and thank God they, they can't do it because Ursula in the end is a humane, he never killed anybody. She was, you know, she had a gun, she knew how to use it. She, if there had been a partisan fight, she would have been at the forefront of it. But she wasn't a brute. But, but we often look at history, don't we, and expect it to produce moral answers for us, that it is somehow a kind of black and white moral fable, that there are goodies and baddies. The goodies win, the baddies lose, and that somehow, you know, history is going to give us a lesson in civics well, actually, history is not like that. And, and it seems to me that espionage is not like that. History is made up of fascinating shades of grey. And Ursula is one of those people. She is not a one-dimensional plastic heroine. She's not a James Bond, female James Bond with a pistol in her purse, you know, doing the right, you know, she is a complicated symbol, not a symbol, but a sort of, she's a product of history. And, and I didn't want to write a book that either defended her or condemned her. I wanted to write a book that somehow explained or, or tried to explain what communism was like to experience through the life of a single woman who lived right from the beginning of communism, right to its chaotic end. That's fantastic, Ben. Again, the book is Agent Sonia, and I recommend it to every single person listening and every single person out there in the blogosphere. It's a wonderful book. Let's go to some of the Q&A from our, from our listeners today, if you don't mind, and I may take the opportunity to ask you another couple of questions myself. Please. Thanks so much. So we have Richard Ramsey, uh, who would like to know, and I think this is a good question. Has Russia acknowledged uh, Agent Sonia, Ursula Kaczynski, in depth? Has Russia done anything perhaps to deny her activities? I wonder if you could tell us something about that. Well, the answer to the second question is on the contrary. I mean, uh, Ursula wrote, when she got to East Germany, completely reinvented herself as someone else. But she did write a memoir. She wrote her own memoirs, which were presented to the Stasi, uh, the, the, the sort of repressive um, security service of the East German communist regime. And they took one look at this handwritten manuscript and said, you can't possibly publish this. It's far too honest. It contains far too much about your love life, far too much about tradecraft. So they bowdlerized it. They took out, they ran a red pen through it and took out quite a lot of the most interesting stuff and she was allowed to publish what remained. And what remained was really a kind of propaganda exercise, but it did, it was intended to show that she was the, you know, the master of, of, of spying and so on. But being the Stasi and being tremendous German bureaucrat, the original manuscript, which is in the Stasi archives, which I've had access to. So I, one of the great pleasures of this book has been being able to write about what the Stasi didn't want you to know about. Um, so she was known in her lifetime, uh, and of course, as I said at the beginning, that came as a huge shock to her family. I mean, they had absolutely no idea. And, the, and it, she emerged as Agent Sonia. That was published in the 70s. Another version was published in the 90s. So she was kind of known in communist circles. But after her death, Vladimir Putin, no less, uh, emerged to say this woman was a heroine of the Soviet Union. You know, she's, she's, you know she, was a, she was a star. So they have begun to acknowledge her. They've begun to celebrate her. The book is going to be published in Russian, which has come as a huge surprise to me. My books are sometimes not terribly popular in Russia um, for reasons that you can probably speculate on. But but this one is going to come out in Russian. So and I'll be fascinated to see what the reception of it is because it is a complicated portrait. It's not. It's not. A, she's not a simple heroine of the Soviet Union. She's much more complicated. So yes, they have acknowledged her latterly. Not enough, I'm sorry to say, to allow me free and unfettered access to her archives uh, in Moscow, which may come eventually, um, but they ain't going to come very soon, I don't think. Richard, actually, Richard Ramsey has another really good question, and I, I would like you to address this, if, if you don't mind. What was Ursula Sonia's life like after the war? I found those, I found those portions of the book to be just fascinating. What does a, what does a retire, how does a, how does a spy retire? I, I, guess. Well, I mean... The astonishing thing is that once she got to East Germany, and I won't give it away for your for your listeners, but there is there's a moment of escape. I mean, because MI5 eventually get onto her, and she does get out. Uh, so she arrives in East Germany, and she gives up the spy trade. Now it's the, 
Soviet spying is a very difficult club to leave. I mean, it's quite a hard club to get into, but it's even harder to get out of. Um, you don't just walk away from this. But she did. She, she just washed her hands of it. She said, I don't want anything more to do with it. And instead of there being recruited, she w- did come under suspicion from the Stasi at one point. They did spy on her. They, she was suspected of disloyalty at one point, but she survived all of that. And she completely reinvented herself as someone else. She became Ruth Werner. She changed. Her, she adopted a pen name, and she began to write novels for children, children's children's fiction. And she was highly successful. She sold hundreds of thousands of copies. She was even described once as the the East German answer to Enid Blyton. Um, she sold so many copies. She did, and she became more famous as a children's novelist than she ever became as a spy. Um, So she did that thing that she'd done throughout her life of inventing and then reinventing herself. But it has to be said, ideologically, the scales began to fall from her eyes. I mean, there were several events that took place while she was, as it were, in retirement from espionage. The invasion of Hungary, the the crushing of the Prague Spring in 1968, these, these moments when it became clear that the Soviet Union was even more repressive. And for her, one of the terrible moments was the discovery of the purges when she found out ex- just the, the sheer scale of the carnage that that Stalin visited on people that she knew. I mean, many of the people that she knew and loved most in her espionage world were liquidated by Stalin. And that was a terrible moment for her. But she said in later life, and again, I'm, this is a defensive thing to say, and it makes one feel a bit queasy reading it, but she said, I didn't do this for Stalin. I did this for an idea. I did this for a cause. And I still, even in her 90s, she was saying, I still believe in that cause. So interesting. I mean, you know, like many old communists, she looked back and she said, it's not the fault of communism. It's the fault of the people who have tried to uh, bring it about in the wrong way. So she blamed people, not the idea. And that was often the, the sort of slightly sort of um, queasy defense that old communists would come up with. Um, often in the tw- 20s and 30s, at the time of the purges, uh, ideologically committed communists would say things like, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs and talking about the lives of two or three million victims of Stalin's purges. It uh, sounds at least Sonia at least was able to somehow come to a realization later in life. I think she was, and I think she felt deeply troubled by what she had lived through and also troubled by the fact that she'd survived. I think she had a certain survivor's guilt. One doesn't want to overuse that phrase, but she often asked herself, and she writes very movingly about this, about how and why she had been spared when so many others hadn't. I mean, most of her closest colleagues were liquidated. And as a foreigner and as a Jew and as a spy, she was triply suspect. Those, Those were... Those were the absolute target of the NKVD informers. But it's fascinating that not only did she never denounce anyone else, she was never denounced herself. And that, I think, is is interesting because that was the currency, if you like, of of survival. You survived in silence Russia by saying, I'm innocent, but but Ivan over there or my neighbor or my brother-in-law or my even my, you know, my family, you, you survived by fingering someone else. She never did. And she was never denounced herself. And I think that is, in a way, a tribute to her character. She was able to inspire quite extraordinary loyalty among, among her friends and colleagues. We have a question from Facebook uh, from a Catherine Bell. And a good question for you, Ben. Of all the spies you've written about, which do you think was the most clever? Uh, which was your favorite? And Catherine also wants you to know that she loves your writing. Oh, thank you, Kathy. Um, okay, which was my favourite? And which uh, they're two different questions. So my favourite is still there was a character that started me off who was called Eddie Chapman, uh, and he was Agent Zigzag, and he was a proper crook. He was an absolutely professional con man and safe cracker, and he was recruited by the Germans while in in the Channel Islands, and he was highly trained by them as a German spy. Parachuted into Britain in 1942 and immediately swapped sides immediately went over to the British and said, well, I'll spy for you against the Germans. Uh, and he's a, he's a tremendously bad person in all sorts of respects, but he's, he's a wonderful character. And he's, you know, he was a proper crooked opportunist. And had the Germans won the war, I think he would have simply have flipped over to that side. But his life is full of adventure. And he kind of set me off in a way on this story. He, who was the cleverest? 
Who was the cleverest? Well, I mean, Kim Philby was pretty good at this. I mean, we were talking earlier about the ability to remember compound lies and to remember what deceits you've already launched. Uh, to coin a phrase, nobody did it better than Philby. I mean, he was really good at it. But then also, the, I mean, the bravest would probably have to be either Ursula. I mean, you know, to put your own life, to put your family at risk like that, that was that takes a rare, raw kind of courage. But the book before this, the one I wrote about Oleg Gordievsky, um, who was a Soviet KGB officer who spied for the West uh, for a dozen years from deep inside the KGB, that took a particular kind of bravery to be inside the Soviet machine, knowing that at any moment you had one tap on the shoulder, you would be arrested, tortured and killed. That for, for sheer steel bravery, hard to beat Oleg Gordievsky, I think. We have a uh, question from Richard Goldblatt, and it's a good one. How much did intelligence provided by the Red Orchestra, the Rota Capella, contribute to the Red Army's victory at the Battle of Kursk? If you wish to broaden that, uh, I mean, like how, you, you said that Ursula's uh, intel was really valuable. Did it often get down to the level of the operation in the field? Did, did Ursula or did these spies we're talking about materially impact events on the battlefront? It's a really good question and one that is still debated is the extent to which the Soviet espionage system inside Germany materially altered Soviet policy and strategy in the battlefield. And it, it will be endlessly debated. And I'm not really an expert on that. One has to bear in mind that Ursula was gathering this information. She, Sorry, she was transmitting this information. She wasn't actually gathering it to herself. So her job was not to analyze its importance or its or its status, it was simply to send the raw material over. So her job while in Switzerland is closer to that of a courier and collator and 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 a kind of radio operator. Really. She was at some one point she was the only radio operator operating out of Switzerland. Did she know the value of what she was sending? I don't think she did really, and she didn't really see that at that point as being her role. I would argue that yes, it did have a material impact at Kursk. They were also able, these, this, these networks of spies, to, to give chapter and verse on the buildup of, so, uh, of, of military forces inside the Reich, the disposition of military forces inside the Reich. That was incredibly useful to Stalin. But Stalin, and it's a fascinating thing about Stalin, is that he didn't really trust spies. He, he tended to disbelieve, because he was such a paranoid and, and, and extraordinary person, he tended to disbelieve the intelligence that he was receiving. That also went for the extraordinary material that Richard Sorge, who ended up in Japan, who gave warning of Operation Barbarossa, which was really ignored by Stalin because he just didn't trust spies. And I always thought the greatest example of that was the Cambridge Five, this, this extraordinary amount of material that was being sent from British spies in, in Britain um, before and during and after the war. And it was of such good quality that Stalin and his analysts believed that it all linked up and therefore it must be untrue. So one of the greatest sort of spy holes in history ended up in Stalin's waste paper basket because he didn't really trust spies. So you've got that interesting balance there, I think. Good question from uh, Kay Shoemaker. How did you come across her children and, and how would you describe them? How, how, did, how was that contact made, Ben? Well, it was fascinating, really. I mean, I discovered that two of the three children were still alive, the two, the two sons, one in his 80s, one by that point in his early 90s. And I found them in the telephone book. I mean, it's, you know, that's often how these things happen, is you sort of trawl around enough, you find them. And I approached them with some trepidation. I mean, both the sons came to East Germany with their mother, uh, the, the eldest son, who was at Aberdeen University at that point, um, who was already in his 20s, came a little later. They lived under the East German regime. They were both leftists. I don't think either ever joined the Communist Party, but they were both on the left. They were very proud of their mother. I wondered how welcoming they would be to a British writer turning up and saying, right, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to write about your mother's life. I mean, all biography is burglary, as we know. You know, it's... Uh, you know, they and they were understandably initially fairly suspicious. They didn't quite know what was going on, but I got to know them. And and after a while, I went to meet both of them. I was introduced to them. I went to see them several times. And as time went on, and it's been a long project, they they became really very generous. And in the end, they turned out to be those 
wonderful sources that you always wanted in a story like this. They simply turned up with boxes of material, metaphorically, and said, help yourself. We'd love to see what you write. We'll only change. We'll only tell you if we think you've made a factual mistake. Otherwise, it's over to you. And that's that happens. I know from experience that happens very rarely in this world. Most people, most descendants of of somebody want to control and have their own family stories and their own family myths about what happened. And we all do this in life. We kind of look back on our lives and we frame them in a certain way. And Ursula had told them stories eventually. She didn't do it very willingly, but sort of in the latter part of her life, she began to talk about her espionage career. And some of it did fall into that family mythology area. So I did find myself at times having to say to the boys, the boys, they're considerably older than me, but, but you know, Actually, that wasn't quite the way it happened. And to their great credit, instead of saying, well, it's our family, it's our mother, we'll tell you what the truth was. They said, fine, you know, if, if, it's, if that isn't the way it happened, that isn't the way it happened. So they turned out to be absolutely extraordinary, really, incredibly generous. Ben, all biography is burglary. I'm going to be quoting that one for the rest of my life. I want, you, I want to thank you for that one. Um, we have William Craig Dubashar as, a, I, I think, a good question, maybe a uh, a, a, a little of a pointed, a little barb to this one. Her actions, were they all based on socio-political ideals? Did she get paid for her spying? Very interesting. Good question. That's a, that is a good question because of course, it's a truth that is very seldom acknowledged in espionage, but most espionage is based on money. I mean, I've never come across a spy who didn't say, I'm doing this for a higher calling. I'm doing this because of a set of beliefs or, but I've also never come across a spy whose motives were not much more mixed than that. Spies spy for all sorts of reasons, but most spies spy for material gain. I mean, it's not something that our intelligence services like to admit, but that is the reality. It's not true of the Soviet system because of course they didn't really do that. They, they would pay informants. They didn't pay their officers very well. It did tend to come from ideology. And, and at that point in the war, I think the same would also be said of, of Western intelligence services. Certainly the officer class didn't do it for money. They did it out of belief. But nonetheless, money is what oils the wheels of this operation. And Ursula was paid. She was paid enough to allow her as a housewife and mother to keep going in wartime Britain. She was never hugely paid. And at one point they stopped paying her. It was largely an accident. They, the great mighty intelligence machine of the Soviet Union had in fact got the wrong dead drop site at one point and was leaving oh. money in the wrong tree. But though she was paid, she never profited. There is, there is, there is no question that she, she did not do it for material gain, but did she use the money? Did she need the money? Undoubtedly. Did it make her rich? Certainly not. We have one last question from Scott Ramage. Uh, it's a good question. You've talked about her sons. Uh, what happened to uh, other members of the extended family during the war? Did they survive? I'm, I'm thinking, for example, uh, uh, Ben, of her brother, Jurgen, who was a, a scholar and a prolific writer of some, no, churned out thousands of articles in the course of his life. What happened to Jurgen? Jurgen also, well, the entire family got out, well, not the entire family, but her immediate family got out of Nazi Germany just in time. I mean, they were absolutely targets for the Gestapo. They were on that. They ransacked the house several times. The father had already managed to escape to Britain. The mother took the, the, the children, the, the girls, uh, there were five of them, and got them out too. Ursula was already out. Jürgen, by this point, had already moved to Britain. And they became British. Uh, most of the family, most of the, uh, of the daughters of the family married Englishmen. And their families are still around in, in London, where, I, where I'm talking to you from. Jürgen, in fact, before Ursula went back to East Germany, I mean, he was a proper, he'd also been a paid Soviet agent. I mean, he was, he had his own spy story, which is interwoven with Ursula's. And so he was providing intelligence um, to the Soviet Union right from the beginning, um, including some very important American information that he was gathering as part of the strategic bombing survey. Um, so he was right at the heart of this too. And he went to East Germany before Ursula and he, he lived there till, till the end of his life. And so the two eldest siblings ended up back in, in East Germany and became really pillars of the sort of communist world there. Although Jürgen was so mad and difficult that he kept of the, of the authorities and the rest remained British. So you have a kind of a British part of the story and, and a very German part of the story. And there is a very tragic part of the story because there were parts of the extended family, almost all of the rest of the extended family were rounded up in the Holocaust and murdered. 
Um, so so Ursula's, Ursula's determination to battle fascism came from the heart. It came from what she had seen happening to her family. You know, Ben, um, we've come to the end of our hour together, unfortunately, and I know the audience agrees with that as well. I love this book. I know that readers everywhere are going to love it too. Um, this is a book where arrested spies really do reach into their pocket and pull, uh, pull out an incriminating piece of paper and swallow it, uh, where that nice lady living next door may be you know, packing the ammonium nitrate in, in her uh, basement. It's Agent Sonia. It's out now with Crown, and I, I can't urge our viewers strongly enough to get a copy of it and read it. Thanks so much for spending time with us today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Brilliant. Thanks, Ben.